Hey, um, I'm in beautiful Indonesia, um, and this is towards the central part, Jawa Tenga, and I'm in a small city, not even a city, it's a town called Jepara, which is about two and a half hours from Samarang, which is a major city with its own airport. And I was just thinking, um, you know, just thinking about what has changed uh, in, in my in my lifetime, um, and how can I sort of express it in a way that makes sense? And what what I think has really happened, and you know, especially coming into all these smaller towns, and being being able to feel a difference in the way people treat each other, the question is how has that happened, and how has that changed over time? And in, Indonesia has had a fairly difficult history as well. It was um, one of the bulwarks against communism funded by the United States and a lot of other people within that post-World War II um, security framework. And so it had a lot of issues, not just uh, because of different wars, because of different people funding the country and having foreign capital come in. It had a lot of other issues as well because of its currency. Uh, the Dutch came in quite some time ago uh, they renamed Jakarta, which actually we had a different name. I think it was Jayakarta, and they renamed it into Batavia. They actually imprisoned quite a few people, including Diponegoro. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, um, and ultimately exiled him to a different you know, place. So what's really sort of interesting is, is still coming here and still seeing the culture, which is a very warm culture. It's an island culture. and you know, I'm from the mountains originally, um, and so you can sort of feel a, a vast difference in how people treat each other. But the reason, and the reason I'm, I'm, I wanted to talk about this, and, and uh, I'm right next to the beach right now, and, and I'm sort of, you know, haven't had any coffee. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about is how society in, in, the, in America has changed, and, and why it's happened that way. And I think I might have a unique sort of insight simply because I, I was uh, I am an immigrant and I've been to quite a few different places and I've been able to see the rise and as well as the decline and the changes within the US since I've grown up in that country and of course when you travel the first thing you see um, are the differences between regions you go to Europe the first thing you see is much better public transportation you see a centralized healthcare system and ultimately, you see a, a situation where some countries post World War II uh, decided to outsource, you know, to the United States, their defense capacity in exchange for open markets. Now, this worked out very well for the U.S. post 1945 because the U.S. has always had a, quite a small population, and it's always been an isolated, it's always been sort of out there in the middle of nowhere, um, with a very sparsely populated neighbor to the north. Um, and of course a major population center to the south um, and if you actually go to South America and Central America you do see a failure to invest in in America's own backyard despite having trade agreements and that's sort of changing a little bit uh, Mexico City is, is a lovely place um, but of course the public transportation is nowhere near uh, what it is in a lot of other countries uh, in Europe which are also partners with the US and you have to sort of try to realize why this happened and obviously the answer is World War II. That's, the, that's the, what happens when you travel is you get to see things a little bit more clearly. You go to Germany and Japan and they are the most advanced countries in terms of infrastructure compared to anyone else. Why? World War II. They were built up, built up from scratch. You would think that the London as well was bombed heavily um, and again it's also got a, a not good public transportation system. They continued, you know, after World War II, the UK was in debt. Uh, they had to pay reparations to the United States. And they did that in various ways. Um, in some cases, they even occupied each other. And, and you actually had, um, after World War I, you had you know, French troops stationed still in, in, in Germany trying to make sure they would pay back. Because they had to pay back reparations twice, um, which then led to, uh, you know, the rise of fascist groups within Germany. Uh, that were becoming more and more upset uh, that they were paying, that were essentially paying out outside of the country so much of their effort when it came to producing steel and a lot of the material that was necessary for the rest of the world to, uh, you know, to, to for the victories of World War One to be to enjoy 
uh, the, at that time, a high quality of life. And, you know, I'm struck by, you know, just sort of the, the differences that, that have happened here and, and, you know, the failure of most Americans to realize just how isolated they actually are geographically. Um, and Australia is really known as the outback. It's known as sort of the country that's in the middle of nowhere. But in reality, it's always tried to get closer to Asia because uh, it's so so close to it. And of course, it's got so many natural resources. Um, it's always been sort of a battleground in terms of politics. And so it's not that Australia has always been isolated. It's really the fact that it's just a massive country. Um, and there's been different opinions on how to maximize resource output. Um, and then how to use that money to develop other places within that area. And within the infra security infrastructure, once again, you do have a disproportionate people, in a number of people in Australia that have died in many, many wars. Um, and so from a security standpoint, um, they are part of this network that aligns itself with the UK, America, New Zealand, Australia. Um, and, so, and so ultimately, you once again see how countries can become very interesting and very unique because on the one hand uh, you have different factions within the country pushing them closer to Asia and others pushing them closer to the West. Um, and that dichotomy in terms of the economy has happened in many other places. Um, you know, you have this, this struggle within Western countries between the security establishment trying to push the countries towards what they believe is a homogenous network that will over time lower security costs and make people safer. Whereas you also have a private sector that realizes that, you know, safety is of course necessary, but if you have a small population, especially an aging population, uh, it is necessary to have exports and, you know, doing well and innovation within the consumer side to do well in order to grow as a country. Otherwise you have all this debt uh, that's been taken on uh, that won't be paid off. And because it won't be paid off, ultimately you're going to live in a society where most people don't own things. They rent things or they aspire um, to become uh, not necessarily nomadic, but ultimately they, they are not necessarily tied down to one place. Because one of the features post-World War II was the availability of affordable housing. Uh, and that allowed people to set roots. It also created in large part the tax code in the U.S. that, put, that gave favorable highly favorable status um, to uh, mortgages in the U.S. Where you, could, where you could deduct a considerable amount of money from uh, your wages in order to promote home ownership. And that succeeded. Uh, it succeeded in part because the banking sector also benefited. Uh, they were able to have a hard asset that was presumably worth a certain amount or the stated amount. Um, they could then be taxed and then you have this whole framework where everyone is on the same page. And that's, again, the military standpoint. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone benefits within that exclusive circle. And then you try to make that circle as big as you possibly can over time uh, while maintaining a centralized uh, center for a centralized, I guess, uh, I'm trying to explain. One of the differences is that in countries that don't have a centralized, a strong centralized government, you end up with more diversity, but also less development. And so you, you have this really interesting, again, sort of dichotomy where you know, you're know you able to see that the dangers of having a centralized government or centralized anything because it leads to a homogenous structure. Um, at the same time, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you see people that don't, you know, not having access to, um, you know, trash is just waste management services um, you, you start to see that not everything can be privatized quite easily um, and that then has it leads to its own problems um, what I, I actually started out trying to not be so uh, meandering but I, I started out because I was I was a bit sad actually um, not not only due to not having a coffee shop anywhere nearby um, but I was just thinking about how um, things have changed for you know, all over the world and how a lot of the impetus for those changes is really based on the post-World War II structures maintaining their own influence and demanding their own due. And w when you think of it that way, you realize that this security infrastructure has always needed, needed to have an enemy in order to justify its growth.
and the enemy has changed over time it always changes and I kept thinking to myself what was it like before and I don't obviously I don't know I don't know what it was like before in, in 1900 I don't know what it was like we, we keep being told that it was a horrible place um, to the extent that you were not part of that majority uh, part of the majority race or religion in that area and for the most part that has to be true um, but it's true because slavery has played such a large part in human history um, and, and, anyway you know, New Orleans has been um, you know, it's really a French city that's why you're the French Quarter but slavery in that area took up I think I, I, I'm trying to remember the book that I read uh, but it was a massive part of the economy and it was such an influential port that even today, you know, 100 days later, uh, you go over 100 days later, later, you go into New Orleans and you see that it's completely different from most places in America uh, because of that influence, because of the French and so on. And, and in terms of Mexico, the United States was really sort of seemed determined to keep the French out of Mexico. And one of the Napoleons had tried to make it into a, a new, the new French empire. Um, and you keep, you, keep, you keep seeing these things where the United States sort of kept pushing back people from coming in uh, and setting up shop and setting up influence, but then didn't necessarily influence, want to do the influencing themselves, um, which led to less development. And part of that, it's really confusing to me because Mexico has a lot of oil. Um, and you look at a country like Chile, which has a lot of lithium, which is also necessary. And you, you start to see, you start to ask yourself, what, what, what's going on here? Um, you know, you've got, you know, there's, there's no reason why Mexico should not be as prosperous as Canada, at the very minimum. In fact, it should be more prosperous. Um, and yet, it's not in terms of infrastructure, in terms of currency. And those are, those become the issues you think about. It's not just that you're able to, you know, after traveling, you're able to open up a map and say, oh, Nova Scotia, that's in Canada. What is that? Oh, suddenly it's not just a name on a map. It's actually, um, you know, it, it means something. It means New Scotland because that's where people from Scotland sort of came by to create a new life. And so you start to see this whole sort of human chain of, of events tied between people who yearning for freedom in different areas and other people that were subjugated um, into slavery, which probably made the impetus for freedom even more um, vital um, for a lot of people. And so you see this mass human chain of immigration happening all over the world. Um, for the last you know, 150 years, and I'm, I'm a part of that. Um, and it, it, it's something where you, you begin to, uh, I think, you know, it's not just the fact that you open up a map and you're able to see why is that person there, why is that the name of, you know, that city, um, you know, because there are a lot of cities that, of course, they have Spanish names in California, um, that makes sense, most people know why. Um, most people look at a mission a church in uh, California and they know why it's named the Santa Maria or the Santa Clara. Um, but I think a lot of people may not know if you go to Quebec that the reason that that's a French speaking part is because the Americans tried to invade Canada um, and also extend their influence uh, and were actually pushed back by the Quebecois. And so that's why they have a, such a fierce independence even today. Whereas the West, which has, a, you know, which is Alberta, that whole province, has a lot of, um, hey, how you doing? Uh, do you I don't know anything, but why don't you just say hi? Hello? <laughs> there we go. All right. So, nope, no, thank you. Okay. But thank you for asking. Um, and so, you get to uh, sort of see these things where, because of Alberta being in the West, it had a lot of um, uh, natural resources, whereas Quebec did not. So you see why, suddenly you see a lot of Texas influence. You see that, that oil and gas knowledge being exported into Texas to the point where from Texas into uh, Alberta. And the, the question again is, there's, a, there's rodeos now, they have a stampede in Alberta. And if you're looking at it from the outside in, you start to realize, well, maybe was it Alberta that influenced Texas or was it Texas that influenced Alberta? And it's gotta be the other way around. It's gotta be Texas into Alberta simply because uh, the characteristics are so similar um, and then you realize that capital, capital injections and development really change the culture. So even in a small population um, country like Canada, you go from the west to the east and it's completely different. And this has obviously led to some issues um, in Canada. At one point, Quebec wanted to secede. It, it almost did. 
I believe the vote was was so close it was less than one percent. Um, so it's a situation where you know the the point is that all these secession movements, all these differences, are not new. They look different because the war of, of different wars over time, they've led to people who look different being you know having to move to different places, which is a good thing. Um, anyone who's been to a landlocked place that hasn't had any development, you can very clearly see that the population is, is um, I, I don't want to say inbred, um, but you can see that the, the, the characteristics are not healthy. Um, in part because, you know, when people look the same, um, uh, similar, similar I should say, um, you know, it, it, it's you, you go back to that idea of why being a, having a homogenous centralized system is good in the short term, but maybe not in the long term. And I think that people, you know, within the power structures today, they, they take the opposite view. They take the view that having a centralized system is better in the long term, be, simply because it does make things easier to manage. And that's true. If you look at, say, delivery packages, how do you deliver something? In the United States, because a lot of those neighborhoods are set up, the suburbs uh, were set up in terms of a, um, in, in order to make it easier to govern, and you know that's why it's such a grid. When you go to, into the most suburbs, they're a grid. Uh, it's easy to police. It's easy to control um, because it's easy to map. And so that makes me think about Czech Republic when the Soviets tried to occupy Prague. Uh, the first thing they did in Prague was they took down the street signs, which made it impossible for people to make, say, Soviets to come in and the soldiers to try to figure out where they were and communicate. They had to set up an entire new city, and it also made it difficult for them to track other people. They didn't have GPS back then, obviously. Um, so you start to see again, you know, this whole battle between the, this military idea of centralization being good for everyone in the long term, despite the loss of diversity versus this other idea of this human struggle to be free from precisely the kind of safety that is, uh, that is being imposed upon them. Because what the military tends to forget, the people behind war, they tend to forget that it's, it really is, at the end of the day, us versus them. Uh, and in the sense that you're not in that majority group, that you're not in the sense, you're not in the side that supports whoever has the most guns, you end up being the one that is displaced. And that is something that a lot of people who are opposed to that homogenous structure understand a little bit better. Or it's not that they understand it better, it's that they are willing to sort of deal with the ups and downs within that cycle that is more diverse. So in other words, they say it is true that it's gonna cost more money to have, um, you know, if we have immigrant, immigrants coming in. Um, it, it's true, especially if those immigrants um, lack an education, if they're smaller, for example, if, they, if they're younger um, and they haven't, they don't speak a language. It's true that they, it's going to take some time to build up. And in the past, it wasn't that difficult because it was physical labor. You could take somebody that knew how to build something and immediately make that person productive in that economy. Um, you still see the same, that, that's one reason why anywhere you go, uh, anywhere you go, uh, you see uh, restaurants setting up everywhere. So um, if you come here to people, places that are, that are maybe not as developed, you still have people that are, say, Chinese, but they have their own restaurants, they have their own Chinatowns. Um, because again, you, you have a situation where people can come in and they know how to cook and everyone wants to eat. Um, and that's why a lot of the most interesting people have been you know, people who have worked in kitchens, like a Chris Rock or an Anthony Bourdain. Um, because it's a universal kind of work. So what you see over time is not just a centralized war machine trying to make things safer by making things more homogenous and easier to control. You see a struggle against that. And not only if you're on the side that's being, you know, that's not within that same power structure in the sense that you become a refugee um, or you simply leave um, or you decide that, you know, you're not in, in a position where uh, you want to be part of a, an increasingly homogenous society. So within all these different sort of movements over time, um, you know, you're able to look at a Chinatown on the map and say, how did that happen? It happened because of all these different revolutions back in everywhere. These things happened everywhere. Um, and so 
and, and, and people think, oh, there's Chinese, well, you've got the Hakka, you've got the Hokkien, you've got the Cantonese, you have all, all these different dialects, by the way, right? Um, people who speak Cantonese are all, then you have the Taiwan, which in and of itself um, is, is a fascinating story. Um, and, and it's, it's just that like, one sort of, you know, place has so much, so much history, and that's why you, anywhere you go, you see people who are Chinese. If you see light-skinned people here in Indonesia, it's because they're part Chinese. Um, and you know, you go around all over, all over the world, you see this idea of how to extend your influence from a place as far as Texas, all the way into a place like Alberta. How do you do that over time in a way that creates a very pleasant place to live like Alberta that also benefits to people making the investments like in Texas, that are back home in Texas? Um, and how do you do it in a way that's sustainable? Uh, because you know, just because something is commercially viable and highly profitable uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily um, the best thing for everyone. And part of the movement away from things we can do with our hands, like cooking and like building things, all those things, you know, again, they're universal. Cooking and building things are universal things, universal activities. Once you start moving into technology and you move away from building tangible physical objects, you start to see that this military machine that is, in, that is invested so much in controlling population centers, making them easier to manage. It's not controlled, it's just, from that perspective, it's just easier to manage. You start to see how that investment in surveillance and technology has now led to a denigration of the value of blue collar work. And it's also led to, in some societies like America, pitting groups against each other. So you have, say, an established group um, a workers union of some sort um, that is now opposed to immigration uh, because they they believe in, in on, on the higher levels on the smart levels of that organization they argue that we have to have certain standards we've built over time and in order to maintain those standards we have to go through different checklists and different operations and have an, a separate you know, pro, you know project manager and a foreman in order to figure, make sure that the product that you use every day whether it's a bridge or a building is done properly and if you have people that are outside of this network that we've created over time uh, you end up not knowing whether that cement is legitimate or whether it's, it really is you know um, whether it's, it's it's something that has been properly made into concrete and you know you don't necessarily want to be in that building if that's the if, if that's you know something that hasn't gone through a centralized system a subset of a centralized system and of course, that goes against, you know, that pits them, that group against a lot of people who say, I know how to build this. I'm not, I don't need a license. I've been doing this for 50 years or 15 years uh, back in Mexico. And, you know, if you want to hire me and take that risk that my methods of doing things are maybe different, uh, and that's fine. You should be allowed to take that risk. Uh, you shouldn't have to go through a centralized structure. Uh, and then, of course, you've got this whole push where people that are not part of that centralized structure or are not willing to pay prices to maintain that centralized structure, you start to see um, to the extent that that, this, this is the problem with centralized structures, is that to the extent they stop growing, you have offshoots that become a consequence of the lack of growth. And so suddenly you have all these other groups that are formed in opposition to the centralized group that stopped growing. And typically, one of the biggest problems is that centralized group grows through debt and banking influence. So you have all these different groups, and it happens in the art world, too. You have, um, I believe I saw an exhibit um, in Europe, and it was the Dada, D-A-D-A. -D -A, and they were formed in opposition to somebody else, and they, just, and they just kept going. And they became centralized, they started getting a lot of the capital, and then they began excluding people, not necessarily because they wanted to, but because there's only so much a centralized system can grow without excluding other people. And the beauty of America on paper has always been that you've got this centralized system that allows, that is, allows for decentralization and also checks and balances. And because of that, you can go to Texas and it'll be, it'll be different than California. And if you, because of that, even within one state, even one state is decentralized. So it won't be the same uh, if you go to, say, San Francisco versus Los Angeles. All these things will be different because they will all have their own local voice and their own local structure. And if things get too far, but all of them have to meet a minimum standard that is set, a very minimum standard that is set,
by the centralized structure. On paper, um, this has worked, quite frankly, very well. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm thinking about now is why things have gone, gone downhill, why things are, are in decline, and how it, how it went into decline so quickly, when on paper it seems like it should work. Um, especially better than the alternative, which is a centralized system that we know cannot grow uh, without promoting a homogenous structure that typically ends up excluding certain segments of society that it then has to exterminate or uh, compete with. And, you know, you start to see that every centralized system has within it the seeds of its own destruction. And so the more decentralized you make something, the more likely it is that you're going to have that whole apparatus survive. But in order to make it survive, you have to, over a large country, I think that's something that I've never studied before and I'm not able to organically figure it out. Um, you know, whereas if, I, if you go to a smaller country, whether it's a Liechtenstein um, or a Singapore, you can very clearly see how that centralized government works with it on, a, on a local level uh, and how, how it can be successful. Um, and then you come to a country like Indonesia that's so massive and you start to see that perhaps you need more centralization. Um, and then, then the question is, how do you create these, a governance structure that, and this is something China is struggling, must be struggling with right now. How do you create something that's going to last a long time and still maintain things like, you know, these different, you know, dialects like the Hakka and the Hokkien and it's going to maintain all those things over time. Uh, so that you have to that you minimize social conflict so that the children of grandparents can speak to each other in their same language um, And is that something that is worth preserving? Um, you know Singapore is one of the most obvious examples of it, it initially wanted to have uh, two languages taught in all of its schools um, You know in order to make sure that you have a balance and then over time it decided that you know, no, when I switch to English, English is the language of the future. Uh, you've got this port uh, that's that, you know, we want, this is going to be the basis of our economy. Um, and we have to be able to make sure people speak English so that we can have a seamless you know, system in place um, that will make sure that everyone within the country reaps the benefits of this economic, um, I guess, source of income that is going to be transacted and transacted mainly in English. Um, because that's where the economic power is in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, uh, up until the 1960s. Um, so um, you, you really, you know, you've really got so many different things going on. And you go back to the struggle between this, these centralized systems using capital and then extending their influence in a way that makes a place like Alberta look like Texas, that makes it homogenous over time, but also allows for um, good things you know in other words you've got a system where alberta is no longer just you know land it's got population that it can grow um it's got a lot of you know it, it, without that investment the question is you know if it wanted to be on its own then it would have to invest in its own navy to transport the oil and the natural gas and if you combine resources into a centralized structure then you can have everyone benefits so you start to see, as you analyze these different things, is how do you figure out what should be centralized and what should not be centralized? And also, how do you make sure that these offshoots, the people that you, that you will exclude over time, how do you figure out a way to make sure that you reap the benefits of their contributions um, and also create a society where people are able to, or are emboldened to speak up, to operate as a check and balance against these power structures becoming uh, so homogenous that they end up deciding to exclude anyone that opposes them, um, especially as they take on more and more debt to expand their influence. And in the worst case, you have a, um, a, a pogrom. Um, it's happened so many times. Everyone thinks that, you know, everyone has a particular pogrom or massacre in mind, but it's happened almost everywhere. It's happened in, in Indonesia. It's happened in Bosnia. Um, it's happened again because of this idea that this centralized structure is able to, wants to expand um, in order to promote safety and stability, especially on the economic side. But again, that goes back to the question of how we can maintain that growth, these, you know, the, and that now have trillions of dollars invested in it, in, in, in that centralized structure. How do we maintain that? 
um, while again at the same time getting that benefit from diversity so we don't end up looking like all, all of us we don't end up looking like each, you know each other on the same island um, and that's that shouldn't be the end goal um, so it's it's all very interesting in the context of the trade war between the u.s standoff between the u.s and china which again goes back to what i'm talking about that you have this telecom situation where you've got this new technology it's called 5g and it's something where you know one side wants to make sure that it controls that technology that it's able to manage it and it doesn't want to compete with a foreign power like china with its huawei coming in and and trying to create this splintering it's more diversity, um, which usually leads to lower costs. But it's just like that example earlier, which is surprising, where you've got these unions that have a centralized system. They want to maintain standards of, that they set themselves. They claim it's for the public benefit, and often it is. Um, but over time, you have to sort of, you know, people start to question, is it really for the public benefit, or is it just for, your, for you to maintain your own power? Um, and so... That's, in some level, surprisingly happening on the tech side, where the United States is saying, we're doing this so we want to maintain, because we want to maintain security standards that we think that China doesn't have. Um, and that's why we're excluding them. But this goes back again to the, exact, the same fundamental human and economic problem and issue that keeps coming up over and over again in fracturing societies. And the question is, how do we, how do we fix that? Germany has a very simple, straightforward answer. It says, we're gonna set the, you know, if you wanna come in, we will set a security standard that applies to everyone. As long as you can meet those standards, you can come in. Um, and we're gonna, you know, of course, Germany is going to set those standards in conjunction with input from its own, you know, home-based businesses. Um, and so one gets a sense that, you know, we have to ask yourself, why isn't the US doing the same thing? And that again goes back to this centralized system that doesn't like competition and it doesn't see itself that way. It doesn't see itself as just liking competition. It sees itself as simply trying to make the world a better place through more stability and through better uh, management. And there's no question that a supply chain is better if it's homogenous, if everyone, in, for example, aviation, if everyone speaks English, there's no question it's a better system and an easier system to manage. Um, if you have people speaking the same language in the control center um, versus the and on the planes all over the world. So uh, that's the battle. That's what we're seeing now with this trade uh, standoff. And the question is, what are the... T it's fascinating because the question is, what are the standards in this age-old issue between the established and the new, between the systems that want better centralization so they can manage output better uh, and security better uh, versus the idea that we all benefit from the uh, diversity, not just in, in, in the sense of technology of new products, but because those new products are, come with people, they, there's people attached to it. So there, there's a greater likelihood that somebody from China is able to come into the United, to the United, to the U.S. and exchange whatever you know what they have with them, that culture, that language, that then makes it easier for us to understand, uh, perhaps a little bit better, what's going on, you know, 10,000, 20,000 uh, miles away. Um, and so how do we get all that all that's all part of a package uh, that we're obviously not managing very well so it's been very long-winded here um and uh maybe i'll get that coffee right now <laughs>